So when you're graphing two lines and you want to find the solution to the system, that's a system of two equations, you can find the solution because it's where they intersect. Now, most kids do not like to graph lines unless they're in slope-intercept form, which isn't really that difficult for a pre-calc kid. You guys would just do a little bit of work to solve for y in both equations. Now, when you get to your, your next test on this, please stop and show a little bit of work so you don't make some mistakes with negative signs. So, like, for instance, when I solve for this y, um, I would add the y over here and subtract the 4 over here. It doesn't really matter. Either way, you end up with x, y equals x minus 4. And then when I solve for this y, that's a really easy move. You just subtract the 9x over. And then we're supposed to graph these lines and see where they intersect. So obviously this is not a strength of mine because I can't graph. So x minus 4, that line starts down at negative 4 on the y-axis. And then it has a slope of up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. And I'm going to cheat and use my shape tool. Maybe. No, or not. See, I can't even draw that. It's cheating. All right, so then the next line starts at positive 6. And the slope is negative 9 over 1. So you'd travel down 9 and then to the right 1. So your job is to figure out where they intersect. And because I have such a tough time graphing, Sometimes you'll notice, like, I don't finish graphing the lines. That's really naughty of me, and you guys need to actually graph the lines. But, you know, I'm your teacher who can't draw. So let's pretend I graphed that green line. The place where they intersected, that is the solution to the um, system. So that ordered pair location is 1, negative 3. And all your algebra and pre-calc teachers alike one, uh, really appreciate when you write them as ordered pairs. The other exception would be if you, if you listed x equals 1 and y equals negative 3. So... That is a solution to a two-variable system, written as an ordered pair, of course. But when I graph two lines, do they have to cross? No. What would be a situation where lines would not cross or intersect? They're parallel. Okay? So if they're parallel, we say there's no solution because they will not have a, an intersection. Um, the, other op the other option when you're graphing lines, although I'd hope you'd notice this before you go to graph it, sometimes they're the same line. So then they would intersect everywhere, indicating that's what you guys used to call infinitely many solutions back in the day. Okay. All right, so this, this may have been a while. Let's look at um, number three. So there's a question. Well, there's a lesson coming up where we need to use these skills, and we're graphing linear inequalities this time. It's not good enough just to be able to graph lines. Now you have to know whether the line is solid or dashed, and then you also have to remember how to shade these because these have an infinite number of solutions that are bounded within a region. So I'm going to start by graphing y is less than 9 sevenths x plus 5. So I, of course, start at 5. Normally I'd travel up 9, right 7, but I'm going to fall off the graph. So instead, let's go down 9. I think I said the wrong number, but down 9. Left 7. And then before I actually commit to graphing it, is this going to be a solid line or a dashed line? It's dashed, and what that means for us is that on the green line itself, because the inequality says only numbers that are less than your line, the boundary line of the line does not include any solution. So we indicate that by putting a dashed line. One more thing before I move on to the next line. I was supposed to graph everything that is, that is a less than sign. So in Algebra 1, it's possible that your teacher made you test points, like test something on one side or the other of the boundary line. I hate that because kids mess it up. <laughs> so I just say less than means below the line. Can you guys tell which side is below the line? Yeah, just do it that way. So less than my line would be shading down here. Notice I'm not actually shading yet because we're not ready. All right, the other line starts at negative 8. And then normally for a slope of negative 4 sevenths, I'd move down 4 right 7, but I'm going to fall off. So let's go up 4 and left 7. This line, this time it's a solid line, oh boy, because it's got an inequality with an equal to bar on it, so anything that's on the blue line also counts as solutions, and that was a greater than symbol. So rather than testing any points, why don't we just say greater than means above the line, which would have been up here. So then you kind of squint and envision all of these things being shaded. Where would it overlap? It would overlap right here in the middle. 
And that's about as good of shading as you need to do for me. Okay? Remember doing that? I know it's been a while. Okay, solving by substitution. We're pre-calc. We can handle something a little nastier. Let's look at number seven. So substitution was a technique um, for putting one function into the other because right now you have two unknown things, but if you were able to substitute for another one, and we use substitution a lot in pre-calc, um, then it simplifies the existing question. So in algebra, sometimes your teacher gave you a formula for x or y already isolated. Uh, in pre-calc, you often won't see that. So you have to do a little work to get a formula for x or y. So when I investigate the question, I'm looking for who is the easiest thing to get isolated, and it would be that y right there. So if I isolate that y by subtracting the 2x over, now what I have is a new recipe for y. So this is where the word substitution comes in. Anytime I see a y elsewhere in the problem, I'm going to replace it or substitute it with that. So here we go. Top equation is now... Still a negative 4x, still a minus 2, but instead of y, you replaced everything that, uh, that was a y with a negative 2x minus 8. So it's not real pretty, but at least there's one variable. So we're going to solve. Just be careful on your algebra here, guys. There's some double negatives going on here. So you have negative 4x, and then it's a plus 4x, and then a plus 16 equals 7. This is where all the Algebra 1 kids freak out because they're like, ah, my x is canceled. So just trust in the math, guys. The x's do cancel, but you end up with the statement 16 equals 7. What is your math trying to tell you? Does 16 equal 7? No. no. So what's your solution? No solution. Yeah. So when your variables cancel, that means you're not going to get what's called a unique solution. You're either going to get a situation where you have no solution, or the other option is you get a statement that is horribly true, but not specific and helpful. So like, for instance, if we did all the math and it came out to 16 equals 16, yeah, 16 does equal 16. So what's your solution then? <coughs> Infinitely many solutions is the case there. So if you get a statement that is super true, but not specific, that means you have many solutions. It's the same line on top of the other line. All right. By the way, what would this look like if I graphed it, the one that came up with no solution? They would be parallel lines. Very good. All right, elimination. This is the method that everyone liked. So technically, the name of this is linear combination. You are going to create a new version of at least one of your equations in an effort to cancel out one of your variables. So like right now, if I were to add everything up from top to bottom, nothing's going to cancel. But if I did a little work, I could make things cancel. So like, for instance, what if I wanted the x's to knock out? If you multiply the top one by a negative 3, the top x would be a negative 12x, and it would cancel out with a positive 12x. So the trick is you have to multiply everything in the top equation by that negative 3. This is what's called a linear combination, and it's equivalent to the original problem, but it's got a little extra fun stuff going on. Uh, is that negative 78? Cool. All right, so then the bottom equation, still 12x plus 4y equals 28. And now when you go to add the system together, you'll see the elimination component right there. You end up with 25y equals negative 50. And then, of course, divide both sides by 25, and y is negative 2. Is that your entire solution, though? No, because in this problem you had two unknown things, so you have to go back and find x. So you get to choose your favorite equation from the beginning of the problem. Do you have one? Because I don't. Hmm? The second one? All right. So 12 times x plus 4 times y, which would be negative 8. Whoops, not that, Abruzzo. All right, I'm just going to call that negative 8. And then add the 8 and uh, divide by 12. So, again, math teachers typically like solutions to be written as ordered pairs. Make sure it's x comma, ugh, x comma y. Or you very specifically identified who's x and who's y. So, what if we skip ahead to number 10? I want to solve that one through elimination. 
And it's your, there's no wrong answer to this. If I ask you, would you like to eliminate the X's or the Y's? There literally is no wrong answer. Sometimes it, one is easier than the other, though. So anyone have a, a thought? I would have gone with the X's, too. Anyone have a reason why they went with the X's? Smaller numbers, that's good. Anything else you notice about the X's that the Y's do not have? Opposite signs. Yeah, I hate messing with negatives because that's where mistakes happen is the negative sign. So if I don't have to change signs, that makes me very happy. So if I try to eliminate the X's, I need to come up with a common multiple for 3 and 2. Turns out it's 6. Um, in Algebra 1, they might have given you the, the choice of just multiplying each equation by the other numbers. Um, that always produces a common multiple. Sometimes it produces a greater common multiple than you wanted, but it doesn't matter because you're just coming up with a linear combination that will knock out. So if we multiplied this top equation by a 2 and this bottom equation by a 3, they would become 6x and negative 6x, and you'd have a, a cancellation. <coughs> All right. I can't tell you how many times I messed this problem up yet <laughs> this last hour. All right, so that's, um, where are we at here? Negative. 26y equals 52. All right, divide both sides by negative 26, and y is <laughs> negative 2. And then you'd go back to your favorite equation and plug that in. So anyone have a favorite equation from the beginning? Hmm? Top one? Okay. 3x minus 7 times negative 2 is plus 14. Um, subtract 14. And x is negative 6. So ordered pair notation would be negative 6, negative 2. All right, so solving systems of equations by graphing, substitution, and elimination, also known as linear combination, should be super review-y. Uh, graphing inequalities, maybe you don't have tons of exposure to that, but it's not that bad. This stuff, we're going to skip. We just, we're going to not have time. So three variables, we're going to revisit them when we learn about matrices, but we're going to skip solving them by hand. It's okay, trust me, you're not losing anything. Um, but could you please find this question? Because we've seen this question in Algebra 2, and Honors Algebra 2, and possibly Algebra 1. And the problem that we encounter in Algebra 2 is probably the same problem we're going to encounter in pre-calc, and it really relates to reading. They say on standardized testing, many of the questions that are missed on the math test have absolutely nothing to do with your math skill and everything to do with your reading skills. Like it'll say, give me the solution for X, and kids give the solution for Y. Or the, like I've seen uh, system questions like this one, where you solve the system, and it wants like three times the value of x plus two times the value of y. And that's the answer you're supposed to find. So just read carefully like what they actually want you to answer. So here, your first task is to determine how many unknown things there are, define variables, and set them up as to what they represent very specifically, and then use those variables to set up equations and then eventually solve. So we have senior classes of high school A and B are going on a trip to the county fair. High school A rented and filled 12 vans, 14 buses for, to, uh, with 888 students. High school B rented and filled two vans, six buses, 324 students. Each van and bus carried the same number of students. Find the number of students in each van and each bus. So my first question is how many things are unknown to us in this question? How many variables are we going to need to set up? Two. What variables would you like to use? And this is, I don't care. So what would you like? X and Y. Man, you know I hate X and Y. All right. Matt, what does X represent? Eh. Do you remember how salty I got this in Algebra 2? I'd write something like, what about it? Is that unknown? See, this is so fun because I was hoping someone would do this because this is the same conversation I have with Algebra 2 kids. There you go. It's all coming back to you now, right? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing kids tell me on this question is, oh, usually they use V and B because they're normal, but whatever. Uh, and they go, V, vans. And I go, that's not good enough. And they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, what about the vans? Color of the van, number of vans, number of kids on the van, how many wheels are on the van? Like, what, what does V represent? 
So then usually the next thing they say is number of vans, because that's a common thing, right? And I go, well, that's a problem, because I know how many vans we have. So it can't be a variable. So what do we not know, Matt? Number of students in a van. There we go. So you can say X represents, and I don't mind a little symbol if you want, but number of students in each van. So then what does Y represent? Very good. Number of students in each bus. So your variables have to be clearly defined and very specific and, of course, accurate. So now using Matt's weird variables, thanks, Matt, uh, we have to fill 12 vans, 14 buses for a total of 888 students for the first high school. So 12 vans times the number of students in each van. So that would look like 12x. And then 14 buses times the number of students in each bus. And those numbers have to total up to 888. And then the other high school rented two vans. So two vans times the number of students in each van plus six buses times the number of students in each bus for a total of 324. So this would be the definition of your variables. This would be the system of equations. And then using one of our techniques, which of course you guys are all going to go for elimination because that's easier here, um, you're going to solve for x and y. So then you're going to get x and y. Would it be appropriate to write your answer as an ordered pair? Not here because this is real. Well, it's a stupid question, but it's a real life question. So what should your answer look like? It should look like communication between people. You don't go running up to someone and be like, 45 comma 17 or whatever it comes out to. That's weird. What would you tell a person? What's the answer, by the way? I don't know what the answer is. Let's search it. The answer is, I don't know, 18 and 48, I think. If anyone solved that ahead of me. Okay, I heard the answer was 18 comma 48. So that's not an answer for a human. The answer for the human would be uh, X represents 18. So there are 18 students on each van, and there are 48 students on each bus, like with words. And maybe a capital letter and punctuation at the end. Throwing that out there. Okay. So um, we're going to continue on with systems on Monday. However, after tonight you're focusing on today, uh, the studying for tomorrow's test. But after tonight, including like time in class after your test is done, you guys need to focus on maybe getting started on the systems homework, which you don't have the assignment list yet, so don't start tonight. Uh, and then tomorrow I'll also have a gigantic review packet to get you ready for that post-test. So this weekend you guys are doing a lot of independent work on systems and on um, reviewing for the post-test. 